Well, on behalf of the Center for Middle East Studies at the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies at the University of Denver, welcome to our final event for the fall quarter, the ISIS crisis, Iran's policy toward Iraq and Syria, and the Iranian-Saudi rivalry, a lecture by Mohsen Milani. Yeah, I have two distinct memories of hearing the name Mohsen Milani. The first was when I was an undergraduate student in Canada. And I was uh, in the library stacks, sort of looking at books. And um, I came across this book titled The Making of Iran's Islamic Revolution from Monarchy to Islamic Republic. And the author was Mohsen Milani. I read the book. And I found it an incredibly insightful, objective sort of account of events leading up to the uh, Iranian Revolution. At that time, it was in its first edition. A subsequent edition was published. And it has been translated into many languages and used in um, colleges and universities across North America and in Europe. Um, and since then, Mohsen Milani was on my radar screen. And I've benefited over the years from reading his insights and his analysis on Iranian foreign policy, Iranian domestic politics. Um, and um, um, I encourage my students, he's on the reading list. I'm teaching a course this semester, this, this quarter here at, at the Corbell School called Post-Revolutionary Iranian Politics. And Mohsen Milani is on the reading list. So that was my first memory of encountering the name uh, Mohsen Milani. The second memory was fairly recently, a few months ago, I was just walking uh, in this building and Chris Hill, our ambassador, our dean, sort of approached me and said, uh, Nader, what do you think of Mohsen Milani? And I told him that I valued him as a, as a scholar and basically I told him what I just told you, that I thought he was a very serious um, analyst of Iranian um, foreign policy. And those two events really um, uh, um, led to today's event and today's invitation. Um, um, with uh, Professor uh, Mohsen Milani. And the timing of his presence here could not be better. Not only is the ISIS crisis a major sort of turning point in the politics of the Middle East, it's now one of the major sort of global crises that affects the entire world, but also we are sort of in the last two weeks before the deadline of the Iranian nuclear negotiations, and uh, Professor Milani has recently returned from Tehran, so I'm hoping that perhaps either in the course of his remarks or during the question and answer session, he can give us a sense of what the mood and the political temperature is in Tehran with respect to that very important uh, issue. In terms of his formal title and his, um, um, his position, Mohsen Milani is the Executive Director of the Center for Strategic and Diplomatic Studies and Professor of Politics at the University of South Florida. He is currently writing a book on Iranian foreign policy. Um, and he has recently published a series of articles in the Washington Quarterly in uh, Foreign Affairs, uh, mapping Iran's role in Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan, and the Iranian-Saudi rivalry and the prospects for a detente between Iran and the US in the context of the ISIS crisis. Professor Milani has been quoted in the BBC, NPR, PBS, CNN, Al Jazeera, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, The Guardian, The Economist, etc. Um, he conducts a new conversation series on global security at the University of South Florida, bringing to campus key experts for an in-depth conversation uh, about uh, global uh, political challenges. The format for today is that Professor Milani will speak on the announced topic for approximately 30 minutes. Um, Ambassador Chris Hill will uh, provide some comments, and then Professor Milani has the uh, option of uh, commenting on, on Ambassador Hill's comments, and then we'll go to Q&A. Um, please join me in welcoming to the Corbell School, Professor Mohsen Milani. Good afternoon. It's really a great pleasure and great honor to be here. Uh, but I have to tell you, uh, in Florida, in Tampa, where I live, <laughs> it's about 74 degrees and sunny. So, Ambassador Hale, Mr. Dr. Hashemi, and Danny, thank you for uh, making me feel miserable in this <laughs> uh, Before I begin, I want to express my uh, uh, gratitude and appreciation to Danny and to Nader for inviting me. And I really didn't know about this center. But uh, when they invited me and they decided to pay me, I paid more attention. <laughs> uh, and I looked at uh, uh, their activities. And I have to tell you, uh, they have done a fantastic job. And I think the university is blessed to have two serious thinkers, two serious scholars 
who have great names in the Iranian studies and Middle Eastern studies. So thank you for inviting me, and thank you for doing what you're doing for the campus. I also want to express my gratitude to uh, Ambassador slash Dean uh, Hill and uh, Miss Julie Hill for their hospitality, for their kindness. Uh, one of the great benefits of establishing a center uh, at my university, University of South Florida, which only has 43,000 students, <laughs> is that I've had the pleasure and uh, the great honor of getting uh, to know the Hills. They are wonderful. And I have to tell you that Ambassador Hill has done for this university what I don't think anyone else has done prior to him. And that is, he has brought the center, the college, the university to national and international recognition. So thank you, both of you, for inviting me. And I, I cherish your friendship and uh, your kindness. Uh, I have been given 30 minutes to talk about a lot of issues. And I'm going to do that. Uh, but I have to uh, bypass some important issues. And if I do, I'd be more than happy to address those issues during the question and answer. Essentially, what I want to do in 30 minutes is to address four interrelated issues. Number one, I want to give you some perspective on how to look at Iran's regional policies. Uh, two, I want to look at the importance of the invasion of Iraq back in 2003 and how it changed the standing of Iran in the region. Uh, three, I want to say a few words about how everything I've said relates to Iranian policy towards Syria. And finally, at the end, I leave the best for the end, is to talk about the rise of ISIS and how the rise of ISIS has created a great opportunity for the US and Iran to try to manage their conflict, their differences, and uh, collaborate together to defeat the threat of ISIS. So first, uh, let me say a few words about Iran's regional policy and how I think you need to look at it. There are three dimensions to Iran's regional policy. And I submit to you, if you do not look at those three dimensions, you do not understand the subtlety and the complexity of Iranian regional policies. Number one is that Iran, after the 1979 revolution, became an enemy of the United States. And the United States became the enemy of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Until that time, that is, prior to 1979, when most of you were not around, Iran was one of greatest allies of the United States in the Middle East. In fact, there were more Americans living in Iran back in 1978 than any other country except Israel. There were over 55,000 Americans living in Iran back in 1978. And Iran was America's most trusted ally in the Middle East, with the exception of the State of Israel. Then came the Islamic Revolution of 1979, and that changed the orientation of Iranian foreign policy. And overnight, as a result of the hostage crisis of 1979, Iran was transformed from being a strategic ally of the United States into a strategic enemy of the United States. So everything Iran does in the Middle East must be understood in the context of its competition with uh, the United States and the animosity that the two countries have had in the past 34 years. The second dimension of it is, and it's pretty much related to the first one, is that Iran is not at good terms with the state of Israel for a variety of reasons, and I would be more than happy to discuss those, Israel is considered by Tehran an enemy. And I'm pretty sure Tel Aviv considers Tehran as an enemy as well. And in order to understand what Iran is doing in Iraq and Syria and elsewhere, that dimension must be understood. And finally, the last dimension is that there has been a sort of uh, intense rivalry and competition between Iran and Saudi Arabia in the past 34 years. In fact, I would submit to you, there has been a sort of a mini Cold War between Iran and Saudi Arabia. And I will talk about this uh, later on in greater detail. Uh, the, the importance of looking Iran, looking at Iranian policy from those three perspectives is that once you understand what Iran is up against, 
you understand why Tehran has been doing certain things. Two important elements of Iran's regional policy is A, to create spheres of influence in different parts of the Middle East, of the greater Middle East. For example, in Afghanistan, Iran has created a, a reliable in, uh, in, uh, area of influence in the Herat region. In Iraq, Iran has an important uh, sphere of influence in the Shia-dominated part of southern Iraq. In Lebanon, the same way. In Syria, the same way. Now, the competition with Saudi Arabia includes also uh, Iranian policy toward the United States and Israel, because Saudi Arabia is an ally of the United States. Let me just mention a few key elements about this rivalry, because it is important to understanding what is happening in the Middle East today. The two countries, Saudi Arabia and Iran, claim want to have, want to capture the leadership of the Islamic world. Uh, the Saudis uh, adhere to a Wahhabi Salafi ideology, and the adherence to that ideology constitute no more than 10 to 15 percent of the Islamic population. Iran claims leadership of the uh, Shiites in the Islamic world. That is also, uh, that population constitutes no more than 18 to 20 percent. So you're talking about two countries whose ideologies belong to the minorities in the Islamic world. But yet, because of their history, because of their demography, because of the geography, they are trying to capture the mantle of leadership. Then there is the element of oil. Saudi Arabia produces a lot of oil and has a small population. Iran doesn't produce a lot of oil and has a huge population. In fact, it is very important for you to understand that the population of Iran is more than all Persian Gulf countries combined much more than all Persian Gulf countries combined. Today, Iran is the second largest, has the second largest population in the Middle East, somewhere between 78 to 80 million people. So, so the Saudi policy historically has been to increase the price of the increased production and keep the price of oil low. The Iranian policy, even during the Shah's days prior to the revolution, is to decrease production but increase the price of oil. So in that regard, they have been in competition. They also have been in competition in terms of providing uh, support to their proxies in different parts of the Islamic world. Look at what is happening in Syria today. The Saudis have been supporting the jihadists because they want to get rid of Assad, and the Iranians have been supporting Assad because they do not want the Saudis to become a dominant power in Syria. So the, the two countries have also been involved in a sort of uh, uh, proxy uh, war. And finally, the two countries have completely diametrically opposed foreign policies, Iran being anti-US and Saudi Arabia being pro-US. Now, let me now jump from this background, the context, where you have to look at Iranian policy in terms of its competition with the US, in terms of its animosity toward Israel, and in terms of its Cold War with Saudi Arabia. Now let me take you to 2003, because I think the key to understanding ISIS, the key to understanding what is happening in the Middle East today is the year 2003. Let me explain why. At that year, America decided to invade Iraq. I have always believed, I continue to believe, that Afghanistan was a, war of, uh, was a war of necessity. America had to do what America did. They had to go and to dislodge the Taliban because Taliban and their allies, uh, bin Laden, had invaded the American homeland, had attacked American homeland, and America had the moral and political justification to go after those bad guys. But I also believe the war in Iraq was a war of choice. We didn't have to go to Iraq, but we did. And when we did, I submit to you, that invasion changed the landscape of not only the Persian Gulf, but the entire region. And we are still paying the price for the consequences, some of which were unintended consequences of that invasion. Two important things happened as a result of that invasion. And these had, have had profound ramifications. Number one, for the first time in history of Iraq, we had the Sunnis 
who are a minority, about 20% of the population in Iraq, Arab Sunnis, no longer running the show in Iraq. Iraq, for your information, was created after the collapse of the mighty Ottoman Empire back in 1921. The British, with the help of uh, the French, essentially uh, drew the map of the Middle East, and they decided to create a country called Iraq. It didn't exist until that time. Iraq had three provinces. All of those provinces were part of the mighty Ottoman Empire. But the British decided to create a new Iraq. They did so. And from 1921 all the way to 2003, less than 15% of the population ruled over 80% of the population in Iraq. It was a total totalitarian, authoritarian regime, and the majority Sh uh, Shiites were suppressed by the minority Sunnis. Thanks to the liberation of Iraq, for the first time in the history of Iraq, in fact, for the first time in, in, in about 800 years, the Shiites were allowed to become the dominant force in Baghdad. And that was something that the Saudis and the Sunnis did not want to accept. And I submit to you, they still do not want to accept. The Saudis were so pissed off for the invasion uh, that they, they said that essentially America had turned, this is when Iran and America were enemies. They said that in America had given Iraq on a silver platter to the Islamic Republic of Iran. They were so angry that one of their high officials said something to the effect that so far, our relationship with America was based on a Christian marriage. One man, one woman. And I'm not gonna tell you which one is Saudi Arabia. I'll leave it up to your imagination. But then the Saudis said, we are no longer are interested in that kind of marriage. Now we are interested in an Islamic marriage where you can have one husband with four wives. In other words, the Saudis were saying that we are going to explore our options to expand our foreign, to change the orientation of our foreign policy and seek alliances with countries other than the US. Why were they so upset? Why were they so angry? Why did this invasion change the map of the Middle East? Because historically, Iraq was one place where Iranian expansion into the Levant, into Syria, uh, uh, Lebanon, and other parts, Jordan, were stopped by a Sunni-dominated government. If you look at the history of, Islamic, uh, of Iranian expansion, for the past 2,000 years, you see that Iraq is exactly where Iran had either used it to expand its influence and develop and uh, uh, create a mighty uh, uh, empire, or it has been the place where the Sunnis had stopped Iran. With the fall of Saddam Hussein and the establishment of a Shia government, that uh, fortress was removed, and the Saudis were very angry. Secondly, they were very angry because the Shiites became dominant in Iraq. Why were they angry? Because if you look at the map of Saudi Arabia, you'll see that most of the oil they have are located in the eastern provinces. And what is so unique about those eastern provinces? They are predominantly Shia dominated. And they were afraid that a pro-Iran, Shia dominated government in Iraq not only is going to allow Iran to expand its influence, it is going to pose a serious national security threat to the Saudis inside Saudi Arabia, in the eastern provinces. That is why they opposed the invasion, and this is why they did everything they could to undermine American project in Iraq. I am very happy that they failed. Now, the irony of all of this is that even when America and Iran were bitter enemies, America did for Iran what even Ayatollah Khomeini couldn't do for Iran. America removed two of the greatest threats to Iran in the past 30, 40 years. By removing the Taliban, who were a nemesis of the Islamic Republic, they allowed Iran to expand its influence in Afghanistan and Central Asia. And by removing Iraq, by removing Saddam Hussein, they allowed Iran to turn Iraq into an ally rather than into an enemy. 
Remember, the single greatest threat to Iran in the past 500 years came from Saddam Hussein when he invaded Iran. That devastating eight-year-old, eight-year war caused the death of more than 280,000 Iranis and Iraqis. According to the most conservative estimate that I have read by a Japanese consulting firm, the damage to Iran and Iraq as a result of those insane eight years of war, the financial damage exceeded all of the oil revenues the two countries collected from the time oil was discovered in Iran back in 1907 until 1988, 89, when the war ended. So now that threat has been removed. And Iran must be grateful to the United States for inadvertently removing two of its greatest enemies. Now, let me get to the third part of my, of my talk, and that is about Iran and the Syrian war. What is it that Iran wants in Syria? After the removal of Saddam Hussein, Iran felt absolutely great. But the relationship Iran had established with Syria goes back to 1979, before the American invasion. What did Iran want after the revolution? Why did they establish good relationship with Syria? If you understand that, then you also understand Iranian policy toward Israel. Iran was interested in Syria at the beginning for two reasons. Syria was the only major Arab country that, not, that did not side with Iraq against Iran during the Iran-Iraq war. So Iran wanted to befriend an Arab country that was not siding with Iraq during the war. That's number one. But more importantly, Iran was interested in Syria because in southern part of Lebanon, the Shiites are a majority there. But there is also a historical reason for Iranian interest in southern part of Lebanon. Southern part of Lebanon is where Shiism began to grow about 1,400 years ago. It has an emotional uh, significance for the Shiites. So Ayatollah Khamenei, Ayatollah Khomeini, the supreme leader of Iran during the revolution, decided to befriend Assad, Hafez al-Assad, the president of, uh, of Syria at that time and the father of the present uh, uh, president of uh, Syria. He befriended him in order to be able to send money and equipment to the Sattu the Shiites in southern Lebanon. And as a result of that investment, Lebanese Hezbollah was established, which today is the most powerful, the most important strategic asset Iran has outside of Iran. But there was another reason why Iran was so interested in, in, in uh, Hafez al-Assad and in Lebanon. That is, since they looked at America as an enemy, and they looked at Israel as an enemy. And since Israel looked at Iran as an enemy, and the US looked at Iran as an enemy, and since Iran thought that America wants to get rid of its uh, current regime, they wanted to have, they wanted to gain strategic depth against Israel at the heart of the Arab world. And they have gotten that strategic depth because now they have a friend in Damascus who is a friend of Iran, and they also have an organization called Hezbollah with thousands of followers, with a lot of missiles, with a lot of equipment. Their thinking was, if Israel attack us, we can attack Israel from southern Lebanon. So it wasn't just a question of ideological solidarity with the Shiites. It was also a raw, cold-blooded, strategic calculation. We want to have some sort of retaliatory capability against the Israelis, against the Americans, in case they attack us. So the relationship between Iran and Syria developed over the years. And it was fantastic during Hafez al-Assad. But it began to change under the present uh, leader of Syria, uh, Bashar al-Assad. 
When his father was in power, he did not take side between Iran and Saudi Arabia and the other uh, Gulf countries. He had good relationship with both. But in, after he died, and after we had the uh, civil war in Lebanon, and after the pressure on Syria to withdraw its intelligence operation and its military from Lebanon, Syria became more in, uh, dependent on Hezbollah and more dependent on Iran. And therefore, <coughs> therefore Assad abandoned his, the, <coughs> the wise policy of, of his father and began to take side with Iran against Saudi Arabia. And that angered the Saudis and other Sunnis. And when the Arab Spring started, the Saudis and the Sunnis found a fantastic opportunity to undermine Iran and, and Assad in Syria. If you look at the Arab Spring, you would see that Iran and Saudi Arabia were in the exact opposite side of the Arab Spring. Iran supported every single movement in the Arab world, except when it came to Syria. Iran supported the uprising in, in Egypt, in Tunisia, in, in Bahrain. But when the Arab Spring reached the shores of Mediterranean, Iran did not support the Arab Spring against Assad. Now, Saudi Arabia opposed every single movement in the Arab Spring, every single one, except in Syria, except in Syria, because for one reason, not for two, not for three, not for four. Sometimes politics is very simple to understand. They said Assad is a friend of Iran. We don't like Iranian expansion. We don't like Hezbollah. And the way to get even with Iran is to support the jihadis against Assad. And that's the beginning of the trouble in Syria. Because they provided support to al-Nusra and to ISIS and to other jihadis, hoping that they would be able to undermine Assad. The thinking was that Assad is going to go the same way Hosni Mubarak was forced to leave. Well, guess what? Assad didn't go. And we ended up having a couple of a very notorious terrorist organization operating in Syria and in Iraq. And one of them is ISIS, which takes me to the last part of my presentation about the rise of ISIS and what it means for Iran and the US. ISIS became a threat, became known as a threat only after the fall of Mosul, the third largest city in Iraq a few months ago. Until that time, the Islamic Republic had warned Washington, had warned the Western countries about the great influence of ISIS and al-Nusra and other jihadists in Syria. But those warnings were ignored. They were ignored for one simple reason. The enemy of my enemy sometimes is my friend. They wanted Assad to go, and they were ready to tolerate anybody who might undermine Assad. ISIS became a threat after the beheading, that brutal, barbaric beheading of three Westerners. I don't know about you. When I saw part of that beheading, I felt ashamed of calling myself a human being and calling them a human being, too. I just can't get it. I just don't understand how anybody can do that and then show it off. I mean, beheading is a common practice in some countries in the Persian Gulf. But at least they don't show it. These guys showed it. And when they did, I think there was an incredible negative public reaction to it. And then the United States decided to, to do something about it. And I'm very happy they decided to do something about it because ISIS is a threat not only to American homeland, is a threat to the region, is a threat to Iran, and is even a threat to Saudi Arabia. Don't forget, there are somewhere between eight to 10,000 fighters in ISIS who have Western passports. Maybe eight is 
uh, too many, I don't know. I have even read statistic that goes as many as 15,000. Some of them, a few of them have American passport, a lot of uh, pass British passports and French passports, but are, many of them are well-educated and Western uh, trained. And eventually they might go back home and pose a threat to uh, Western countries. But more importantly, they are a major threat to the region because ultimately what they're trying to do is to create a caliphate. Now, the thing you need to understand about caliphate, and I think that's the most important thing you need to know, is that the mentality behind this is against the notion of a state sovereignty, which is the essence of the modern international order. They don't believe in individual state sovereignty. They believe in an Islamic ummah or Islamic community. Now, if they succeed in that, they're going to change the map of the Middle East. I don't believe they will succeed, but that's what they want to do. Now, both Iran and the United States oppose ISIS for uh, a number of reasons. ISIS is trying to undermine the territorial integrity of Iraq. Because if they succeed in establishing an independent Islamic State, that practically means the partitioning of Iraq into Kurdistan in the north, Sunniistan at the center, and Shiistan in the south. That is going to have profound ramifications for the region. And I think one of the reasons why the Saudis are so concerned now about the rise of ISIS is that if we do have the partitioning of, of, of uh, Iraq, and if there is an independent Shiistan, that is bad news for eastern part of Saudi Arabia, because there are also Shia dominated. It's bad news for the Sunni leaders of Bahrain, because 80% of the population there is also Shiites. So Iran and the US oppose uh, the partitioning of the Middle East, uh, of, of, of Iraq. Both oppose the spread of this kind of uh, Salafi, Wahhabi terrorist ideology. They both want to degrade and destroy ISIS. And I believe we've had a number of cases in which it, the United States and Iran indirectly and without any coordination have collaborated to defeat ISIS in certain parts of Iraq. My hope is that after we have an agreement on nuclear issue, Iran and the US can collaborate directly or indirectly to continue the fight against ISIS so that we can degrade and destroy that organization. Now, there is considerable opposition against this in the Middle East and in, 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 in the US Congress, as well as inside Iran. But after having traveled to Iran last couple of weeks ago, I have to tell you, I smell change in Iran for the positive. I believe uh, we have never had uh, the opportunity as good as we have today to have a nuclear agreement, which I believe is going to happen. We will have a nuclear agreement, I believe. Uh, perhaps not in two weeks when the, the deadline, but eventually we are going to have it because the two sides have made enough progress not to abandon the negotiations. And moreover, if we abandon negotiations, the options we have are not pleasant, either for the US, for the region, or for Iran. After we have the nuclear agreement, I think there is a pretty good chance that the two countries can begin to develop channels of communication to address their conflict. And if they do, there, are, there is one place they can start that, and that is the fight against ISIS. Let me just remind you one final thing, and I end my talk. In 2001, when bin Laden attacked the homeland and killed over 3,000 innocent people, the first country, the people of Iran were the first 
to demonstrate against bin Laden and the killing of innocent Americans. Huge demonstrations against it. When America rightly decided to go to Afghanistan and to dislodge the despicable rule of the Taliban, guess who helped America more than any other country in that region? Do you know which countries recognized the Taliban when they were in power and they were indiscriminately killing women and minorities? What three countries? Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, and Pakistan. Iran provided logistical support to American special operations to dislodge the Taliban. And then when we succeeded in getting rid of that evil system, we had a conference in uh, Bonn, Germany. At the Bonn conference in Germany, Iran sided with the United States, abandoned its own candidate for the presidency, and instead supported American candidate for the presidency in Hamida Karzai. Iran played a very constructive role in helping America defeat the Taliban. But unfortunately, because of sabotage by some uh, elements in Washington and elsewhere, instead of developing this relationship, President Bush decided to call Iran a member of the excess of evil, access of evil. And that put an end to the tactical collaboration between those two countries. I hope today we do not allow those same elements to undermine what has started between Iran and the US because you will not find a country, you will not find the people of a country in the Middle East who are more in support of America and support of having good relations with America than the young and the dynamic people of Iran. And I hope we can capitalize on that so that we can have, after 35 years of mutual animosity, mutual demonization, we can develop friendly relationship between our two great countries, Iran and the US. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Milani. I thought that was really uh, as comprehensive and brilliantly uh, analyzed and argued a, a 30 minute presentation as I've ever seen. You see, the cold weather does you well here. You know? <laughs> so um, I think, you know, I was just looking out at the audience through the whole talk, and I could see there are a lot of people with a lot of questions. So I'm going to limit my comments uh, very briefly. And um, one of the things. I, I want to get some better sense of is I think you've very clearly articulated the Iran relations with the Arab Middle East. I'd like to know a little more about what is going on within Iran. And I ask that because anyone who's visited Iran is really struck that in this country that is so dedicated to the proposition that the United States is the great Satan to um, quote, uh, I think, Ayatollah uh, Khomeini, when, you see, when any American, whether it's Tom Friedman or anyone who goes to Iran, comes back with this overwhelming sense of the sort of how positive people are, especially young people, are to the United States. And so is it, uh, you know, blue jeans and rock and roll? I mean, what is it? Is there something else going on? Do they see some of the potential for the... Uh, for common interests that you articulated in your, in your talk. Um, so I'd, I'd like to hear you talk a little about what is going on on the Iran street, uh, if you will, uh, to understand what, what this, uh, why there seems to be this dichotomy. Secondly, I think when you, when you paint a picture of Iran foreign uh, policy, I see a sort of uh, picture of imperial overreach. One, there's this great sense of competition with the Sunni Arab world, specifically to deal with 
Saudi Arabia's effort to define the Sunni Arab world with, as you correctly point out, a real minority um, uh, perspective, Wahhabism. Um, so I can understand some of that, but I do not quite understand why a 1,400-year-old, uh, by my math, that goes back pretty much to the origins of Shiism, why that would cause Iran to be so active in southern Lebanon uh, by funding an organization that has been so dedicated to murder and mayhem and is in fact a charter member of the, uh, of the uh, terrorist list, that is Hezbollah. And then I don't quite understand why, because if you go back pre-79, Israel and Iran were able to do a lot of things together. And after all, um, they don't have a common border. And you would think that that kind of cooperation, which, is, um, which was quite noticeable in the, uh, in the uh, 70s, albeit with the Shah, and which actually continued with Turkey for some time, that Iran would pose itself as this implacable enemy of Israel and take on to itself the notion that Iran can somehow deal with Israel in the, uh, in the way that the uh, Sunni Arabs have not been able to, quote, deal with Israel. And so we see a situation where, I guess I'm asking, does Iran feel it needs to take on to itself and on to Shiism, the notion that it will solve the Israel problem, it will drive Israel into the sea in a way that the Sunni Arabs were unsuccessful. In fact, what I'm asking is, is the Iran hostility to Israel part of its uh, competition with Sunni Arab states? Finally, you know, Americans, I mean, we are sort of, we do go around the world hectoring and lecturing people and wagging our finger uh, at people. And, you know, everyone's kind of getting used to it. It's, uh, you know, it's not the thing they like the most about us, but, you know, they, they're okay with it, basically. I mean, I've been in these discussions where you, you know, you're yelling at some foreign government about their human rights issue. They, yeah, yeah, we've heard this before. But there is one thing that Americans won't put up with, and that is nuclear weapons development. Now, you can say, well, yes, you do put up with it. Look at India, look at Pakistan. They've kind of gotten away with this. And you know, there, there's truth to that. They have gotten away with it. We still consider them important. But frankly, I don't see a way forward in that US-Iran relationship, no matter how many regional interests line up. I don't see a way forward as long as we see Iran playing around with such cuddly, delightful little countries as North Korea. Uh, I don't, for the purpose of uh, technology, of weapons uh, um, uh, uh, technology exchange, I don't see Iran ever figuring out how to work with the United States as long as it has a nucle nuclear ambitions. And I'll say one good thing about the North Koreans they actually are proud of it. They say, you bet we have nuclear weapons ambitions. And yet Iran, throughout all these negotiations, have consistently said, no, they don't. And that goes to another aspect of the American personality. We don't like it when people look at you and say things that they know to be untrue, you know to be untrue, and they know that you know to be untrue. It just kind of gets on your nerves. So. Um, You've had some discussions in Iran. I wonder if uh, any of those issues came up, because I believe that that nuclear issue, and to some extent that Israel issue, I mean, as expressed through support for Hezbollah, um, is a huge block uh, between the US and Iran relations. I think on the Syria stuff, on the ISIS stuff, on Iraq's territorial integrity, mm -hmm. on uh, Saudi Arabia's perfidy and all of that, yeah, I can see a way forward. I just have trouble with the nuclear issue. Anyway, thank you. One of the things I've learned after 20 uh, years of uh, being in academia is to never challenge a diplomat. <laughs> uh, so I, uh, 
I, I have to tell you, I essentially agree with a lot of things you said, but let me um, uh, bring some other elements to the observations you made. Number one about uh, Iranian society. I guarantee you, most of you, uh, have a view of Iran which is very different than, than the Iran that I saw last week. I say that because I do this for a living. And over the years, I've had hundreds of students. And I go to different places and lecture. And I ask people, what do you think about Iran? And most people, when they think about Iran, they think of terrorism. They think of oil. They think of hostage crisis. And because of the negative publicity in this country, they think of Iranian society as a very close society, very much like Korean society. Well. Here is something you need to know about Iran. Number one, it is an extremely young and dynamic country. More than 60%, if I'm not mistaken in terms of the number, um, of the Iranian population are under the age of 40, which means that they have no recollection of the 1979 revolution. They don't have the kind of chip on their shoulder that the revolutionary class has. Uh, Iran is one of the most wired countries in all of the Middle East. I have three teenagers, three girls, who live with us. And when we are having dinner, they drive me crazy because they look at this damn thing. <laughs> so I was so pissed off at them until I went to Iran. My daughters are beautiful. They don't use that as much as the Iranians do. Everywhere you go, you see this. iPhones, uh, American technology is there. And then when you talk to the people, as the ambassador was saying, you see a very different Iran. No animosity toward the US. Poll after poll, taken by credible American companies, show that there is not a country in the Middle East where America's approval rating is as high as in Iran. They even like George Bush. Uh, so that, that, that is incredible. Um, thirdly, we usually think of Iran and Iranian women as veiled women. <laughs> Wait till you go to Iran. And the Iran you see is very different. Yes, they are veiled. But go to their private homes. And when they take the veil off, you see the most pro-Western, modern women you can see. There are more women in, America, in Iranian universities than men. More women in Iranian institutions of higher learning than men. In fact, for your information, there are more American PhDs in President Rouhani's cabinet than in President Obama's cabinet. <laughs> more American PhDs in Rouhani's cabinet than in Obama's cabinet. And women are involved in all kinds of stuff. Despite the attempt by the Islamic Republic to not allow women to get involved in all aspects of life, they are there. You can see them. They are brave. They are defying the government in many ways. And they are very dynamic. And finally, when you go to Iran and talk to ordinary people, you'll be struck by this incredible contradiction. That on the one hand, you have one of the most uh, ideologically oriented Islamic governments you can find anywhere based on what it claims. But then you have one of the most secularized societies you can find anywhere in the Middle East. Now, I, there is no way I can convince you because this is something you have to hear from people. You have to go there, talk to people. Then you would come to the same conclusion that I do. So I think it is very important that we understand what kind of society we're talking about. More than 80 to 85 percent of people can read and write in Iran. It has one of the highest rate of literacy anywhere in the Middle East. Highly wired. Uh, uh, they watch news, uh, American news and American television all the time. And it is not the kind of close society that you think of uh, uh, in, in the media. 
Regarding Israel and Hezbollah uh, uh, and sectarianism, uh, I think uh, Iran, Iranian foreign policy does have some uh, elements of sectarianism, no question about this. And what they do in Lebanon, I think, is an example of it. But there are also other important elements in Iranian foreign policy that defy that sectarianism. I'll give you a few examples. Iran has been accused of supporting Palestinian organizations. Palestinians are not Shiites, they are Sunnis. Iran has paid a heavier price for its support for the Sunnis than it has paid for anything else. Azerbaijan is the only other country besides Iran that has 98%, 98 to 99% Shiite population. And when there was a conflict between the Republic of Azerbaijan, which used to be part of the, uh, uh, the Soviet Union, and Armenia, if Iran would have been the ideological regime that we usually think of it, they should have sided with Azerbaijan. They didn't. They sided with uh, Armenia, against Christian Armenia, against Shiite Azerbaijan. I submit to you that Iran and Saudi Arabia use sectarianism anytime it is to their interest. It is one tool among many tools that they have in their toolbox. I think it is destructive, but I think, I honestly believe, Saudi Arabia is, ha has a bigger interest in pushing a sectarian agenda than Iran has. Regarding Israel and what Iran is doing in Lebanon and the Arab world, I have said that and I've written about it. Nobody listens to me in Iran. <laughs> and I'm very happy they don't. Uh, I don't believe it is in Iran's national interest to get involved in the Arab-Israeli conflict. I've said it many times. I believe it. I don't even believe it is in Iran's interest to get involved in the Arab world, period. I think Iran should focus on Afghanistan and Central Asia, where the uh, uh, Persian legacy is much more powerful than in the Arab world. And Iranians are much more welcome uh, than they are in the Arab world. But that is not how the Islamic Republic sees it. But I do believe that the animosity that Iran has toward Israel is mostly ideological. Israel does not pose a security threat to Iran. Iran knows that. But because of the competition they have with the US, because of the fear they have of regime change, they want to be able to have some sort of bargaining chips against them. And Hezbollah serves that purpose. As I said, they want to have a strategic depth against Israel. Uh, because when you talk to the Iranians, they say the Israelis have now found strategic depth against us in Azerbaijan, as well as in the Iraq. Uh, uh, Kurdistan. So they want to be able to uh, retaliate against, uh, is, uh, against Israel and the United States. And finally, about the nuclear negotiations. Um, I did, I, uh, Ambassador Hale, I am happy to tell you that back in 2009, um, when I did a piece for foreign affairs, I quoted uh, Ayatollah Rafsanjani for having said that Iran has the capability to build the bomb, but we don't want to build it. When I gave them that quotation, the only thing they questioned me when they reviewed the article, they said they want to see the actual article. And I sent them the actual article. Why do I bring this to you? I bring it to you because I believe Iran has become a virtual nuclear power. And once you learn the knowledge to build something, no one can take it away from you. Iran has the infrastructure and the expertise to build it if they want to. I believe they have not made the decision. And I don't believe they are going to make the decision anytime soon. Because there is no, there is nothing they can gain from it. And that is why I believe the two countries can agree on a nuclear agreement. And one of the sticking points of this nuclear agreement uh, is for how long the agreement is going to last. And for Americans, the most important thing, in my mind, 
is to prolong the breakout capability for Iran. The breakout capability is the time that is required for a country to build the bomb should they decide to build the bomb. There are people who believe that Iran can build the bomb if it decides to do so in less than two months. I think they are daydreaming. It's not that easy. They can do it, but it's going to take uh, much longer. But the Americans want to make sure that they can prolong this period so that in case Iran makes the decision, they can intervene and neutralize Iran. But I believe uh, this uh, nuclear deal is in the interest of Iran because you are right. As long as there is the fear that Iran is building the bomb and we don't have any way of inspecting Iranian facilities, we cannot get on the other important issues, but hopefully this agreement is going to allow the West to monitor Iranian activities so that uh, uh, they can be assured in case Iran decides to build the bomb, we have enough time to neutralize it. I hope I have answered all yeah. your questions. Okay, we have uh, time for questions and answers. Um, one, and then Micheline at the um, back, and then David. Go ahead, Habib. Hi, uh, my name is Habib. Uh, I'm from Afghanistan. Um, I have one of your um, presentation, you said that you still think that the invasion of Afghanistan was the right um, decision. Um, given the fact that the um, majority of the people who carried out the terrorist attack on 9-11 were Saudis, um, just a small part of the plan to attack the United States was hatched in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. It was planned in, in Pakistan, in Europe, and other parts. Germany. And there's good evidence that the Taliban leadership didn't know anything about the, uh, the plan to attack, Al Qaeda's plan to attack the United States. My question is that why we should be punished for something that we didn't have anything to do with? That's one question. And the other question is that you talked about Saudi's role in the uh, rise and expansion of ISIS uh, by supporting and funding these, these organizations. Um, what about Iran's support for a sectarian uh, suppressive a Shiite regime in Iraq, which was suppressing Sunnis for, for many years? Thank you. Um, 